It was so great. I, I guess I feel like a groupie. I'm there Facebook looking at all of the pictures from VBS here. Just really, oh, there's who, oh, I recognize that person and so forth. But praise the Lord for what you did. And uh, it's amazing what these kids, one of these days, God willing, will be telling a story of what happened here. And that's really cool. God bless you for that and, and all those who participated. And thank you, musicians and song leader, uh, for this morning. That's pretty cool to hear that good music. The dictionary defines stubbornness, stubbornness as behavior performed or carried out in an unyielding, obstinate, or persistent manner. Someone wisely said, stubborn and ardent clinging to one's opinion is the best proof of stupidity. Stubbornness, stubbornness. We're going to be touching on two people who were stubborn today. This morning, we conclude our series about the lives of Bible people who chose paths of life independent of God. They didn't need him. Our purpose has been to consider the details of the person's life and also uh, look at how God reached out to each one of them to turn them to himself. Who have we looked at? Well, we looked at Rahab, Nebuchadnezzar, and Mary Magdalene. So what about today? Today we talk about two Bible characters. That's not the way I started. I was going to just do one other, but the Lord Jesus describes them as brothers in an illustrating story that we call the prodigal son parable. Okay. But there are two people. There's the prodigal son and the other simply known as the older brother. And no, we don't have any names, but those are the two characters. Now, the scriptures in Luke 15, 11 to 32, what's interesting about this parable is none other than Charles Dickens. And we hear Charles Dickens' name all the time at the holidays for a Christmas carol. Writer of many books, go into any bookstore, you see classic books written by this man in the 1800s. He described this parable as the greatest short story ever written. I think he's qualified to make that comment. So it's really interesting to look at what it goes on in this story. So we'll begin with a walkthrough of the life of the prodigal son and his older brother. Let's not forget him. And then go over to the scripture text and conclude it with takeaways for people following similar paths. Okay. Now, the scripture itself, we're not going to read outright. We're going to go through it as we walk through the message today. So let's look at some background. Now, what's interesting is if you look at Nebuchadnezzar or Rahab, you can say, okay, real person, uh, what was his or her life like? In this particular case, we don't know. This is a story. Are they real people? We're not sure. But there's enough information about someone growing up in this type of environment to figure out what it was like for these two to grow up with their dad. It's a boy. Then years later, another boy. Two sons in the same family. The Lord Jesus doesn't specify where the father, older brother, and prodigal lived. Likely it was in a rural area, out in the sticks. Both sons grew up in a wealthy family. The father was wealthy. Just reading the description of his property, the fact that the older son was a distance away when the party was going on, which we will get to. It was wealth. They had a lot of money there in that rural village. They each went through the Jewish act of circumcision, both boys. Both were circumcised and named on the eighth day after their birth. They were each given a special name that was mentioned that mentions the Lord. No, I don't know what it was for either child. Both were close to their father. That's what happened as children grew up. They may have shown affection for their father than sitting on his lap when they're children. And then as they got older, being obedient sons. Yes, dad, what would you like me to do? They were taught by parents and a tutor. 
Uh, parents, mainly the mother, but sometimes the father and the tutor, well, they had money. So they could very well hire someone to train their children. They had individual paths of life. That's what we talked about with all these other people, Rahab, Nebuchadnezzar, Mary Magdalene, each had their own way to go. In those cases, and in these cases, they were the wrong ways to go. The prodigal decided upon a path of getting his inheritance from his father and spending it on himself. It's me first. I want his money. I want to spend it. I want to have a good time. The older brother decided upon a path of earning his inheritance with no help from his father. I will please him, whether he likes it or not. I don't care for him, but I want the money when he dies. Pretty cruel. That's not like today, is it? Unfortunately, yes. Both attended synagogue school, synagogue school, ages five to nine. Get this, two boys. They studied the Bible itself, beginning with Leviticus, which is what is going to be studied coming up. But it's a tough book. Then other books of Moses, the prophets and Proverbs, along with other biblical writings, ages five to nine like VBS, sort of. From ages 10 to 14, they studied the traditional Jewish law. They got it both barrels, from the Ten Commandments to the other requirements. Age 15 and higher, they studied theology, God studies, Bible studies, from the Jewish commentaries on the Old Testament called the Talmud. See, there were a lot of writing done by the rabbis over the years to explain the passages, much like Christians see today online and in Bible bookstore. You see commentaries on the Bible in various books. So growing up, they had plenty of training. Mom and dad, tutor, and then they went to synagogue school and learned everything from the Bible to theology. Their time as adults. Both sons were responsible for supporting their aged parents. That's what they had to know. You grow up, you're going to have to support mom and dad one of these days. In spite of the fact dad is doing quite well, support them both. The mother is not mentioned, so it's possible she passed away. But that was their responsibility. Uh, a couple usually wanted to have many sons. Why? More people to help them when they got old. They were expected never to dishonor their parents. Never. It was a grave sin to dishonor one's father or mother. It just wasn't done. And in a rural community like that, it was like watching a house that's made of glass. Everybody knew what everybody was doing or were doing wrong. By this time, the prodigal and his older brother had heard about various scriptures, including the Proverbs. And it affected what they were thinking, but it didn't change what they were thinking. Remember the one, I want it now, I want a good time, give me your money. The other one, I want to work, so one of these days I get it all. Both sons would have heard God's word from the book of Proverbs, for instance. A son should obey only the one who gave him life. Proverbs 23, 22. Listen to your father who begot you. Neither one of them liked dad. Neither one of them wanted dad to interfere in their lives. Riches will soon disappear. Proverbs 23, 5. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle towards heaven. A son should pay attention to his father's instruction. Proverbs 1.8. My son, hear the instruction of your father. They didn't want to hear. Money was everything to the two of them. And lastly, one who trusts in riches will fall. Proverbs 11.28. He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. It didn't sink in. They heard it. They knew it. 
but their path of life was totally opposite what they were taught. Okay, let's look at the verses themselves. It's Luke 15, beginning at verse 11. First, verse 11 itself. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling this story, this parable. This is a story or parable that the Lord Jesus told about a family that included a father, an older son, and a younger son. This is the story of that parable. The father was wealthy, possibly a large, profitable business. He employed servants. That's ongoing hired people, but also day laborers, people who were just hanging around to do work. And he paid them. I need extra help. I want you, you, and you. Come join me. He had a profitable business and a profitable piece of property. Verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, the younger of the two sons, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. The younger son shocks his father by asking for the goods he would receive in the event of his father's death. You're old, right, Dad? I'd like the money now. Now, the way it was supposed to work, according to Moses, was two-thirds of the estate would go to the eldest son, the older son, okay? Okay. And one third would go to the younger son. And if it was profitable, which it was, that's a fair amount of money. Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. For a son to say such a thing to his father in that culture was tantamount to saying he wished that his father was dead. Really? Yeah. The phrase portion of goods is not the usual term for inheritance. It's the only time that's mentioned here in the New Testament. The phrase refers to property or material possessions alone, showing that he was unwilling to take the responsibility that came with his share of his estate. He selfishly wanted to liquidate it to use only for his own pleasure. The son was saying, in effect, I want goods from you, but not a relationship with you. Your money is all I want. Word of the son's irresponsible and selfish request would have circulated throughout that village. As I said, everything was open. Everybody knew. The people would have expected the father to be furious with his son. The son who had shamed and dishonored him and take appropriate disciplinary action. In some cases, a situation like this would mean you are dead to me, son. I don't want you here anymore. The father could cast the younger son out of the family and even the prodigal even declare him dead to the family, but he didn't. He didn't. Look at verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, understand that the word prodigal means wasteful. So you get the picture? The prodigal son, the wasteful son. It took a few days for the prodigal son to convert his inheritance into cash. He then headed for a far country to get away from his family his father, and his older brother. According to parallels in Greek literature, the word used here meaning gather together suggests that the younger son converted his assets, perhaps livestock and property, to currency. I want to be able to spend it right away. The far country might have been a Gentile region outside of Israel, he wanted to get away. He didn't want any family to see him. He didn't want any people to see him. Just wanted to take his father's money and spend it. John MacArthur writes, the townspeople would have wondered why the older brother didn't act as mediator. That would have been expected. Can't you help this situation? 
the younger brother, I mean, the older brother should have defended the father's honor and the irresponsible actions of his brother if he loved his brother, which apparently he didn't. We'll see that more later. He didn't intervene to prevent him from ruining his life and bringing shame on everyone. He didn't. Look at verses 14, 15, and 16. But when he had spent all, that's the prodigal son, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And when he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. The prodigal son used up all the money from his inheritance, and then a famine hit. I was reading a contemporary commentator, and he was talking about someone who had done something like that. He managed to get $50,000 for himself. And in weeks, it was gone. The prodigal son used up all the money from his inheritance just as a famine hit the far country. He was forced to take a job feeding pigs, something a Jewish person would never do. The young man was so hungry that he wished he could eat the food given to the pigs because no one gave him anything. Look at the phrase, he began to be in want. Again, John MacArthur, for the first time in his life, he began to be in want. Remember, it was a wealthy family. He was the second son. He was a stranger in a foreign land with nowhere to go and no one to turn to for help. He was penniless, destitute, with no resources. Seeking unrestrained pleasure, unabated lust, and unrestricted, unrestricted behavior, he wound up instead with pain, emptiness, and on the brink of death. What happened? Then the phrase, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Again, feeding swine to a Jewish person, a Jewish young man, was not a job for someone of that faith. Pigs were considered unclean according to the law of Moses. But he had nowhere else to go. He had nothing else that he could do. The prodigal would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods, the scripture says, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Arab pods, which is what they used to feed the pigs, were virtually indigestible for humans. Couldn't even eat those. That phrase gets to me in that section. No one gave him anything. You would figure someone might walk by and feel sorry for the poor guy. His worldly friends all deserted him. He had a lot of friends. He had a lot of money. He could not even eke out a living as a beggar. He had to do this. Look at verses 17, 18, and 19. But when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. All that had happened to the prodigal brought him to his senses. His path was wrong. He was stubborn about it. He wanted his money. He wanted it now. But everything changed. No more money. He came to his senses. He realized that to survive, just to survive, he had to return to his father. He had to admit his sin and ask to be accepted as just one of your servants. I'll take that. When he came to himself, 
It took extreme poverty and hunger to prompt the younger son to come to his senses and realize that in spite of all he had done, the correct course of action was to return and become one of his father's hired workers. He came to his senses. What a thing to happen. Everything gone, no one there to help, no one cares, no one helps him. And he realized I was wrong. I wanna go back to dad. Look at the phrase, my father's hired servants have enough bread and to spare. These hired servants were day laborers who were generally unskilled and poor, living day to day on temporary jobs. They would take whatever wages were offered to them. That's what they did. The Old Testament protected these people. But listen to the phrase, they had bread enough and to spare. Wait a minute, these are the temps. These are not the regular servants. But they have more than enough to eat. And I'm here starving to death. The radical remembered that his father was generous with them. He was generous to everyone. The father had said here, I'll let you take the property, convert it to cash, and you can go. He said, he said his, he would take full responsibility for all his sin, the prodigal. Sin against heaven and his father. Now, the prodigal planned to say, I have sinned against heaven and before you. This Greek phrase could also suggest that he viewed his sins as piling up as high as heaven. All of a sudden, you get to think pretty deeply at this point. Something's gone terribly wrong with my life. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I have sinned against heaven as high as heaven. Look at verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. Remember, he's in a far country. He has a long walk back. I have sinned against heaven and before you. But when his father, when rather the prodigal was still a great way off, his father saw him. And you won't believe this, had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The prodigal leaves the far country and heads home. His father, who had been looking for him, sees him at a distance and feeling compassion, runs to his son, falls on his neck, and kisses him. Came to his father. The old writer Alexander McLaren pictures the scene for us. No doubt the prodigal son hesitated when the old home came in sight. And perhaps his resolution would have oozed out at his finger ends if he had had, so up to, had to march up alone to in his rags and run the gauntlet of servants before he came to a speech with his father. So the scripture says, when he was still a great way off, the boy hadn't entered the village. His father ran to protect him from taunts and scorn of the people in the village. As wrong as the father was, he didn't want the son to suffer when the son was coming back. And get this, the word ran mentioned of the father, ran, translates a form of the Greek verb which was used of a person running a race. The old guy ran like a runner in a race for his son. Then what? The father fell on his neck and kissed him. This is in spite of his filthiness and the vile rags he wore. And the word kissing is repeated kissing of his son. What a father. He was right to come back. 
Look at verses 21 through 24. The son is going to go into his speech. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. The prodigal son gives his prepared speech to his father who ignores what is said and calls for the best robe, a signet ring, sandals, and a fatted calf for his returning son. Incredible. What kind of father is that? Generous with his servants, yes. Accepting of a son making a big mistake. And now so glad to bring his son home. And the son had no money left. The prodigal never gets to say the words, make me like one of your hired servants. Did you notice that? The father interrupts him. He cuts off the son to mention the words of blessing. The father now gives the son three symbols of honor. A robe, a ring, and sandals. First, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Maybe take a shower first. No, no. The best robe goes on him. The families in those days had a special robe, and it was a robe that was most beautiful and finely crafted. It cost a lot of money. In the Greek, it means the first ranking garment, the first ranking robe. The servants put it on the prodigal son. Don't you understand what he did to you? Don't you realize that he has nothing and he deserves nothing? The older son would probably have worn that robe first at his wedding because that's what the robe was used for. But now it's on his brother, the prodigal son. And second, Put a ring on his hand. And then they put a ring on his hand. It was a signet ring. And it was on it was the family crest or seal. So that when you could use it to stamp it in the clay on a document. And it indicated it was the decision of the family of the father. Put the ring on his finger. Are you crazy? This one who made such a wrong decision, but he's come back. He's lost and now he's found. And one other thing, one other thing, the third thing, sandals on his feet. Oh, so what? You have to understand that whether it's a on-staff servant or someone who is hired as a day laborer, none of them wore sandals, only the son and the father. He was being recognized as his son, surely, at that point. This, my son, was dead and is alive again. The father now gives all he owns to the prodigal son. What generosity, what love. And stubbornness almost cost him everything. But the story goes on. We have to mention the other brother. 15, chapter 15, 25 to 27. Now his older, his older son was in the field, talking about the father. And he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. 
The older son who had been away in the field returned to the house to hear music and the sound of dancing. He asked his servant what was going on, was told that his brother came home in good health, and the father was throwing a special party for him. Verses 28, 29, and 30. How did the other older brother react? But he was angry and would not go in. Remember, the older brother didn't like the father either. He never saw his love. He was there to earn his inheritance. And when the father died, he would get his money. He seemed to have no relationship with his brother. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. He was mad. He was angry. For him, it was dollars and cents. I worked for you. You owed me. He was furious. He was furious with his father because his father gave a loving welcome to the prodigal son, his brother. And the older son refused to go to the party. The father pleaded with him. Yes, he spent all his life serving him, but he had the wrong motives. The older son ended his angerous, angry tirade by saying his father was giving the fatted calf to his son who spent the father's money on prostitutes. That's who you want to spend your money on? Spend it on me. I'm the better son. He was angry and would not go in. He could not rejoice over the recovery of his lost brother because he had no love for his father. The eldest son said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you, I've never transgressed your commandments at any time. To him, his many years of working under his father had been nothing but slavery. I don't love him. He's my boss. There was no love or respect for his father, merely toil and drudgery, waiting for him to die so he could inherit. And he stubbornly stuck to that. Last two verses, 31 and 32. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. That's the end of the story. What happened to the elder brother? Did he finally stop being stubborn and realize his father loved him? All that I have is yours. I'm not acting as your boss. I'm acting as your loving father. That word son. Son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Although the father retained control over the estate, he had already given it to his son. The word son in verse 31 is different from the other mention of the word in the story. Here it is more the affectionate term, child. Child, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Even love came out there. It's sad the story ends there, so we, didn't know, we don't know what happened there. So takeaways, the Lord Jesus Christ told this tale of two sons to picture two ways people think about God. He wanted to picture two ways people today think about God. As the prodigal son or the older brother. The takeaways this morning call you to identify the type of person you are. That's what I want you to do. Learn the lessons given by the Lord in the story and come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're the prodigal son, 
You grew up hearing about God, but soon lost interest in him. Maybe as a child you heard. God's not important to you. You chose the path of life that centered upon yourself and what you wanted. Just like the prodigal. You took all you could get and separated from your family. I don't want to be around them anymore. All they do is talk about Christ. You found the good times you wanted and people joined you. Then your money ran out. And your so-called friends left you. Then you fell on hard times and suffered a lot. If you're the prodigal, now is the time to come to your senses. Come to your senses this morning, knowing your need to go back to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. God genuinely loves you. The biggest lie that Satan seems to tell people is that God is fearsome. He hates you. He hates what you've done. You'll never, ever be accepted by him. It's a lie. Satan is the father of lies. And when you hear that, you say, you know what? I'm not going to go back. If the prodigal son had thought to himself, maybe I shouldn't go back. But he kept thinking that his father was kind, loving, generous. Even as he got close to the house, he could have said, you know, maybe, maybe I'll turn back. Maybe this isn't a good idea. But he would have been wrong. And you will be wrong if you hesitate coming back to the Lord. God genuinely loves you and will provide all the needs in your life. It is incredible. Lord, help me. And you know what? He does. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin. It's not anything you've done. You need to take the first step back to God if you're the prodigal. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm not the prodigal son. I'm the older brother. What if you're the older brother? You grew up with a distorted understanding of God. The only way I get on the end with God is to do stuff for him. Ceremonies, practices, restrictions. You believe you had to work hard to be accepted by God. You're the older brother. You spent your years trying to earn his love with your efforts. I'm going to do so many things for God that he's bound to love me. You're too late. He does already. You were shocked to see God bless others who behave badly. Why should he be loved by God? He hasn't done anything. He ran away. He spent your money, Father, on harlots, prostitutes. So today, he's calling out to you, older brother. Child, come to me. Rejoice with me. Take the fact that I'm giving you everything. Come to the God who loves you completely, without strings attached. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Older son, understand. I've given you my gift. You have the righteousness of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're just a beneficiary of it. You walk out the door, you get a, an urgent telegram that says you just inherited so much money. You don't say, you know what? It probably is not me. I haven't done anything for it. No, you're the inherited. You've been, you're the inheritor. It 
So when I pray, leave the path of stubbornness, either choosing your own way, putting God aside, or trying to foolishly work for God to be accepted and loved by him. You already are. So when we pray, silently tell him you want to come to your father, God, by accepting Jesus as your savior. He died for you. He's the father. You're the son, one or the other. Let's close our time in prayer. Dear Father, how good is the God we adore. Father, we see it in part in this story that the Lord Jesus told. What a father he was in that story. What a far better father you are in real life. Loving us, caring us while we were yet sinners, while we are still stuck in our own stupidity and stubbornness. You love us. You've been concerned about us. You're waiting for us. You're running to us. And you will bless us incredibly. Father, for the person who's been serving himself and ignoring you, may that person accept Jesus Christ today, silently inviting him to come into their life. And for someone here who has been doing an awful lot to try to please you, Father. May they realize you love them as they are, and you will give them the Son of God's righteousness and be saved. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this incredible story. Charles Dickens was right. The greatest short story ever written. Bless this assembly, those of, who are leaders, those who participate. Lord, continue to watch over them and Bless those children who made a profession of faith. Oh, Father, may your spirit never let them forget. May they be drawn to your word, drawn to the chapel, drawn to believers, and may they grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Thank you for this time we've had together in Christ's name. Amen.